This is the fourth in a series of videos correcting various claims made about the Islamic Golden Age. See the first video in this series for the context. This video addresses claims made about the transmission of Greek and Roman texts to Western scholars by Muslim scholars. It is claimed that Western scholars only started recovering these classical texts in the 13th century when they finally had access to Arabic translations, which they translated to Latin. These two video clips are an example of how the claim is typically made by Muslim apologists. But what they failed to recognize was that most of these manuscripts were translated from Arabic from the works of prominent Arab Muslim thinkers. It was through the translations of Ibn Rushd's commentaries on Aristotle into Latin in the 13th century that the revival of true Aristotelianism took place in the West. In fact, it is acknowledged that these translations were largely responsible for the most important change in the history of medieval thought, which resulted from the introduction of Ibn Rushd's Aristotle to the Christian West. So one claim is that 13th century Western scholars recovered Aristotle by translating Arabic copies of his works into Latin. However, Alison Abbott, senior European correspondent for the scientific journal Nature, makes the opposite claim that Western scholars collected Arabic texts but couldn't translate or study them because they couldn't read Arabic. She says, quote, Although European libraries and museums collected Arabic scripts, they sat in obscurity as they were largely indecipherable. End quote. Regardless of the fact that these two claims contradict each other, neither claim is true. Firstly, as has already been demonstrated in part two of this series, Christian scholars in the Byzantine East never lost access to the works of Aristotle and the rest of the Greek classical tradition in the first place. And even though Christian scholars in the West had their access to these texts severely limited, they nevertheless continued to copy and study the significant number of Greek texts they did possess. Secondly, contrary to Alison Abbott's claim that Arabic scripts, quote, sat in obscurity as they were largely indecipherable, end quote, Arabic translations of the Greek texts were translated by Western scholars as soon as they discovered them. Thirdly, Arabic translations of the Greek texts did not start to find their way to Europe until well after the West had already recovered almost all of the original classical tradition directly from superior Greek texts rather than translations into Arabic. Contrary to popular belief, the event known as the recovery of Aristotle, when Latin translations of the writings of Aristotle and other classical writers were made available to the Western scholarly tradition, did not take place as a result of the Islamic Golden Age and did not result from Arabic translations of Greek texts being taken to the West and translated into Latin, though it did involve some Arabic translations. Historian of philosophy Bernard Dodd describes the Latin recovery of Aristotle in the West as taking place in three stages. The first, quote, in the 6th century with Boethius translations, end quote. The second, quote, in the 12th century with the gradual translation of the entire corpus of Aristotle's work, end quote. And the third, quote, in the late 15th century, end quote. So the recovery of Aristotle actually started just before the Islamic Golden Age itself, with its first peak occurring at the same time as the Muslim translation movement. Classical scholars Leighton Durham Reynolds and Nigel Guy Wilson describe the high point of the first period of recovery as, quote, the classical revival of the late 8th and early 9th centuries, end quote, under the Frank King Charlemagne, during which time Greek texts were reintroduced to formal education programs in Western Europe. Reynolds and Wilson also describe how Charlemagne hired Alcuin of York, who had already been studying and translating the Greek classical tradition, to, quote, take charge of his palace school and be his advisor on educational matters, end quote. So not only was there a continuous line of Western scholars copying and studying the Greek classical texts, though initially on a small scale, by the 8th century there was a deliberate effort made to increase access to these works and include them in formal educational programs. This was taking place well before Arabic translations of the Greek texts found their way to Western Europe. In fact, it was happening at the same time that most of the Greek texts were being translated into Arabic in the first place. The second peak of the Western recovery of Aristotle started in the 12th century, and it was during this period that most of Aristotle was recovered. Ending in the 13th century, this recovery was completed before the Arabic translations were translated to the West. The main Western translation sources of this period were James of Venice in the 12th century, Burgundio of Pisa in the 12th century, Robert Grossetester in the 12th century, 
and the outstanding William of Moerbeke in the 13th century, who not only single-handedly translated or copied almost all of Aristotle's genuine works from Greek texts by earlier Christian scholars, but also translated many earlier Christian commentaries on Aristotle. Marshall Claggett, Professor of the History of Science at Princeton, New Jersey, notes that James of Venice, quote, was probably the first to have translated Aristotle's physics, his De Anima, his metaphysics, and parts of his Parva Naturalia, end quote. He further mentions that James retranslated Aristotle's prior analytics, posterior analytics, topics, and sophistici elenchi, replacing the earlier 6th century translation of Boethius. Claggett also cites an anonymous writer in Sicily who translated three of Euclid's works directly from the Greek, and another anonymous writer who translated Euclid's Elements and Ptolemy's Almagest. Burgundio of Pisa was another 12th century translator directly from the Greek. Reynolds and Wilson describe how Burgundio spent several years in Constantinople as a translator, where he also collected Greek texts to translate into Latin, including copies of the works of Galen, the famous Roman doctor. Still in the 12th century, Henricus Aristippus in Sicily supervised the translation into Latin of works by Plato, Euclid and Ptolemy. Reynolds and Wilson mentioned that, quote, Aristippus himself translated Plato's Phaedo and Mino, some works of Aristotle, and perhaps Hero's Pneumatica, which discusses steam engines, penny in the slot machines, and other gadgets. End quote. During the 13th century, William of Moerbeke produced an astonishing volume of Latin translations, directly from copies of the Greek classical texts, including virtually all of Archimedes and almost all of Aristotle. Professor Richard Lorch writes that William translated almost all of Archimedes directly from the Greek. Medieval historian Paul Edward Dutton likewise says, quote, William of Moerbeke translated virtually all the genuine works of Aristotle from Greek into Latin, end quote. More importantly, Dutton mentions that William translated these texts from Greek manuscripts produced by Western scholars, not Muslim scholars. Moerbeke made his translations and revisions using Greek manuscripts preserved in Europe through the careful work of earlier Western scholars such as Isidore of Seville, 6th century, and Alcuin of York, 9th century. Marshall Claggett notes that Moerbeke was responsible for superior translations of Aristotle's works which had been previously translated into Greek, translations of Aristotle's works which had never previously been translated from Greek, and translations of Aristotle's works which had never been translated from any language. William's translations were not only an invaluable resource for Western scholars who only read Latin, they were also superior to the translations in the Muslim world. Dutton notes that, quote, some of these original works were already known through less accurate versions from the Arabic, end quote, and adds, quote, studies have shown that Moerbeke had access to old and excellent Greek manuscripts, end quote. So, as a result of Moerbeke's work, Western scholars were able to read translations made directly from Greek rather than translations made from Arabic. Consequently, Dutton writes, Moerbeke's translations, quote, laid the basis for the rich scholastic commentary tradition, end quote, disproving the claim that the Western medieval scholarly tradition and later Renaissance were founded on the Arabic translations and commentaries of the Muslim world. So the Western medieval recovery of Aristotle was not dependent on translations from Arabic. On the contrary, it enjoyed access to superior Latin translations directly from the Greek. In fact, William of Moerbeke's translations were so accurate that modern scholars today still use his text as a source for scholarly reconstructions of Aristotle's writings instead of using the Arabic translations. Commenting on the remarkable accuracy of William's translations, Dutton notes that, quote, since he mostly used Greek manuscripts of high quality as his model, Moerbeke's translations are still valued critical editions of the originals, end quote. He adds that in some cases, where there are no surviving copies of any Greek manuscript, William's translations are, quote, the only complete witness to the text, end quote. So by the time Arabic translations of Aristotle were available to Western scholars, they had already recovered almost all of Aristotle and most of the available classical Greek literature. 
Copleston notes that Aristotle's work De Enema was translated from the Greek in 1215, whereas the translation from Arabic was not made until later. Copleston lists three other works by Aristotle, Physica, De Generatione et Corruptione, and Politica, which were translated directly from Greek by Western scholars before the Arabic was available. He concludes, quote, Modern investigations have shown that translations from the Greek generally preceded translations from the Arabic, end quote, adding that, quote, even when the original translation from the Greek was incomplete, the Arabic Latin version soon had to give place to a new and better translation from the Greek, end quote. Maria Muvrudi, professor of history at the University of California, Berkeley, likewise says that, quote, the entire Aristotelian corpus reached the Latin schools from Greek before it did from Arabic, end quote. She notes only three exceptions, Aristotle's work on the heavens and some parts of two other works, meteorology and zoology. During this recovery of Aristotle, Western scholars had a significant advantage over their counterparts in the Muslim world since the Western scholars could read Greek, the Muslim scholars were themselves sometimes using Arabic translations of Latin or Syriac translations of Greek source texts rather than Greek originals. This led to some translation errors and misrepresentations of the author's meaning. In contrast, Western scholars were reading directly from the Greek, ensuring their translations into Latin were far more accurate. Look again at the claim typically made by Muslim apologists. But what they failed to recognize was that most of these manuscripts were translated from Arabic from the works of prominent Arab Muslim thinkers. It has now been demonstrated that the claim that Aristotle was recovered through the transmission of Arabic translations and commentaries to the West is untrue. Arabic translations and the commentaries of Muslim scholars such as Ibn Rushd were not responsible for the Western recovery of Aristotle, which had already started by the time Greek texts were being translated in the Muslim world, and was almost over by the time Arabic translations were being read in the West. It is true that some Greek texts did find their way to the West via an Arabic translation. However, it is important to note which texts were transmitted in this way and when. Contrary to common expectation, Western scholars typically had great respect for their Arab counterparts and actively sought out their work for their own study. In the 12th century, Adelard of Bath praised the Muslim teachers from whom he learned during his travels to Muslim lands. In the same century, Peter the Venerable referred to the Muslims as, quote, clever and learned men, end quote, citing their libraries full of books, and Herman of Carinthia wrote of, quote, the treasures of the Arabs, end quote, a reference to Muslim knowledge. Look again at Alison Abbott's claim regarding the Western treatment of Arabic texts. She writes, quote, Although European libraries and museums collected Arabic scripts, they sat in obscurity as they were largely indecipherable, end quote. This is untrue. In fact, Arabic texts were translated into Latin as soon as Western scholars acquired them. In some cases, Western scholars such as Adelard of Bath in the 12th century even travelled to Muslim lands, seeking out Arabic texts specifically with the intention of translating them into Latin. Contrary to common expectation, it was not Muslims who translated Arabic texts into Latin for the benefit of Europeans. It was actually almost exclusively Western scholars who translated the Arabic texts into Latin for other Western scholars, since the Arabs themselves could not read or write Latin. In addition to these Western scholars, some Jewish and African scholars also made valuable contributions to this translation work. However, most of the Arabic texts translated in this way were not copies of the original Greek scientific works, and some of the translated texts weren't written by Muslims. In the 11th century, Constantine of Africa, a North African Berber, translated medical texts by al-Razi, an anti-Muslim skeptic, Isaac ibn Imran, a Muslim, Isaac Israeli ben Solomon, a Jew, and Ibn al-Jazar, a Muslim. During the 12th century, Adelard of Bath, John of Seville, Herman of Corinthia, and Robert of Ketan translated a number of Arabic texts. These included works by Ibn al-Haytham, a Persian who contributed greatly to the study of optics, Tabit B. Kura, a Sabian who contributed to mathematics, physics, and astronomy, Al-Razi, the anti-Muslim skeptic who contributed to medical diagnosis and treatment, surgery, ophthalmology, and equipment for chemistry, 
Abu Masha, a Muslim who contributed to astronomy, and Al Khwarizmi, a Muslim whose most notable contribution was a revolutionary system of algebra, which was quickly adopted by Western mathematicians. Adelard also translated Euclid's work Elements from Arabic to Latin, which proved immensely useful to Western scholars. Also in the 12th century, the Jewish scholar Avendolf translated Arabic commentaries on Aristotle, which had been written by the Muslim scholar Avicenna. Meanwhile, Spanish philosophers Dominicus Gudisalinus and Johannes Hispanus collaborated with Avendolf to translate nearly two dozen texts by Muslim scholars, almost all of which were philosophical in nature. Near the end of the 12th century, therefore, a range of Arabic texts had been translated into Latin. However, these texts did not represent much of the intellectual brilliance of the Muslim world. Most of the texts were philosophical rather than scientific or mathematical. Nearly all of them were commentaries on Aristotle or other subjects, rather than actual translations of Aristotle and other Greek classical works. And some of them were not written by Muslim scholars at all. Adelard's translation of Euclid's Elements from the Arabic is one of the most significant exceptions. It was not until the last quarter of the 12th century that a greater proportion of Greek classical texts would be translated from Arabic into Latin. Eugenius of Palermo was a Spanish scholar who translated Ptolemy's work on optics, a valuable contribution. Gerard of Cremona in Italy was a prodigious translator of Arabic, contributing at least 70 Latin translations, including various works by Ptolemy, Archimedes, Euclid and Aristotle. However, he only translated one or two books from each of these authors, and in some cases he translated from Arabic works which Western scholars had already translated into Latin from a Greek copy. For example, Reynolds writes that, quote, Cremona seems to have translated Ptolemy's Almagest from the Arabic in Toledo in circa 1175, apparently in ignorance of the existing version, end quote. Additionally, Gerard's translation of Aristotle had little influence in comparison with his other translations. Professor Charles Burnett of the History of Islamic Influences at the Warburg Institute writes, quote, Nevertheless, Aristotelian philosophy was not Gerard's main interest, nor did his translations in this field have such a large influence as those in other fields, end quote. Burnett goes on to comment that Gerard's translations were also quickly superseded by more accurate translations directly from the Greek later in the 12th century. However, Gerard's translations would still have a significant impact, as will be explained later. So, although Muslim philosophers had been writing commentaries on the Greek texts since the 8th century, and although some Muslim medical texts had been translated into Latin in the 11th century, it was not until the middle of the 12th century that Arabic philosophical and scientific texts began to find their way to the West. Consequently, Dronke writes, quote, Not that all the philosophy and theology of the 12th century was influenced by Arabic thought. In fact, it was mainly in the second half of that century that Arabic philosophical texts were translated into Latin. End quote. What then was the impact of those Greek texts which were translated from Arabic into Latin? Ironically, the impact of Latin translations of Arabic copies of the Greek classics arguably had less impact than Latin translations of Arabic commentaries on those Greek classics. There are two main reasons for this. Firstly, it must be understood that some of the Greek classical texts were translated into Arabic but never translated into Latin at all. So these texts weren't transmitted to the Western world by the Arabs. The Western world had to wait until they uncovered previously lost Greek or Latin copies. For example, the Muslim world had Plato's Republic and translated it into Arabic, but never translated it into Latin, so it wasn't transmitted from them to the Western world. Secondly, very few of the Greek texts were actually returned to the West via the Arabic translations. Although almost all of the Aristotelian corpus was available to Muslim scholars by the end of the 10th century, hardly any of it was transferred to the West through Arabic. Western scholars recovered almost all of it themselves, through Greek texts. French philosopher and medievalist Jean Jolivet noted that some works by Euclid and Ptolemy were recovered via the Arabic translations. Nevertheless, he also wrote that, quote, most of the works of Aristotle, however, were translated directly from the Greek, and only exceptionally by way of an Arabic intermediary, end quote. He concludes, quote, translations from the Arabic must be given their full importance, but no more, end quote. Copleston likewise comments that, quote, 
It is a mistake to imagine that the Latin scholastics were entirely dependent on translations from Arabic, or even that translation from the Arabic always preceded translation from the Greek. End quote. Professor and historian of science Edward Grant also makes the point that, quote, of the translations of Aristotle's works, those made directly from Greek were far more numerous than those made from Arabic. End quote. Nevertheless, even though few Greek texts were transmitted to Western Europe through Arabic translations, those which were transmitted were of great value. Additionally, the writings of several Arab or Persian philosophers, translated from Arabic to Latin, also gave Western scholars deep insights, even when they disagreed with the texts, which they frequently did. Consequently, Grant says, quote, Indeed, translations by Gerard of Cremona alone drastically altered the course of Western science. End quote. Grant further adds, quote, Because of the importance of the translated works, the civilization of Islam must be allotted a considerable share of the glory for the Western achievement in science. End quote. This must always be remembered. The legacy of this Muslim contribution will be assessed at a later point. <laughs>